Welcome everyone. My name is Doreen Marshall. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here and caring about this issue. It warms my heart to see so many people who do care and are working to close this illegal, immoral prison. The torture and inhumane treatment has been a stain on this country around the world. International treaties against torture have been ignored. There is blowback from Guantanamo to Bagram to Pelican Bay prison here at home. I want to just mention that as of today, February 21st, 21, 2021, it has, the prison has been open for 6,982 days. You can find this updated every day on Andy's website under Gitmo Clock. Andy Worthington is a freelance investigative journalist, the author of the Guantanamo Files, and a co-director with Polly Nash of the documentary film, Outside the Law. Andy recently wrote, quote, after four long and horrible years in which Donald Trump essentially sealed Guantanamo shut, the arrival in the White House of Joe Biden offers a glimmer of hope that prisoner releases will resume and that there will be movement towards the eventual closure of the prison. However, as with Obama, it may well be a struggle. Thank you, Andy, for all your hard work and for joining us today. Thank you, Doreen. Um, so thank you everyone for um, working on it, uh, getting this to happen. Um, and what I'm gonna do is just give a little overview of the situation at Guantanamo. Um, uh, and then I'm sure that all of you are wanting to hear very much from uh, Mansour Adefi, former prisoner in Serbia, who's um, also a very special guest tonight, more of a special guest than I am. Um, but I thought that if I gave, gave a, a context for things, um, then Mansour would be able to specifically talk about his experiences of um, particularly prisoners that are still held. And I know that he has some very good friends, the people he cares about deeply, who are still held in the prison. And I think that would be brilliant to focus us all on what we're actually asking Joe Biden to do, which is to one way or another, bring justice to 40 human beings who are still held at Guantanamo. They all have their own stories. Um, and um, so I'm looking forward to that myself. Um, <clears throat> it's around about 15 years since I began working full time on Guantanamo. It was around this time 15 years ago that a number of uh, things happened. Um, a, a, a film called The Road to Guantanamo was released, which dramatized um, the experiences of three young British men who had been captured and then ended up at Guantanamo. Moazan Begg's autobiography was published 15 years ago, which I um, devoured eagerly, and that also helped me to understand much more about Guantanamo. Um, and it was also the time that um, the Associated Press won a lawsuit against the Pentagon, which obliged them finally to release to the world the names of the people they had been holding um, at Guantanamo for over four years. So at that point, um, in March 2006 it was, um, the United States government of the Bush administration had not told the world who it was holding at Guantanamo. There were family members of people held at Guantanamo who had no idea that their their children, their husbands, whatever, were at Guantanamo until the list was published of who was being held there. Um, in most cases, you know, the International Committee of the Red Cross had got information to the families. They were the only people outside of the United States and people approved by the United States um, who objectively were able to um, help the prisoners to communicate with the outside world. Otherwise, everything was shut off. Um, and that's really, you know, from the beginning should have been why, um, why people were concerned about Guantanamo, because here was a naval base um, in Cuba, uh, which the United States had managed to hold on to after, after a war over a century ago, um, where the United States had set up a prison and had clearly done that because they had presumed that it would be beyond the reach of the courts, which meant that this was a facility where what they intended to do were things that they were not allowed to do. And in the early days, as, um, as I'm sure we all know, what that involved was a variety of 
um, sometimes formalized and sometimes less formalized torture programs. Um, from my understanding of, of you know, what I could uh, uh, work out from having studied this um, in great detail when I was writing my book, The Guantanamo Files, is that there was a period um, in those first few years when around uh, one sixth of the men who were held at Guantanamo, so this was probably at the peak of the prison's population. So over a hundred men were subjected to a variety um, of the torture techniques um, that involved sleep deprivation and um, the extreme use of extreme heat and cold, preying on people's phobias, forced nudity, shackling in painful positions, playing loud music, um, all of these things. Um, these, these particular programs came to an end um, after June 2004, when the prisoners first won their right to habeas corpus, the right to go before an impartial judge and to ask why they were being held. Um, the Bush administration then colluded with Congress to try and stop habeas from um, having any impact, which they successfully did for four years, except that lawyers were allowed into the prison. That broke the veil of secrecy, which had been what the Bush administration relied on to do what it wanted to the, with impunity to the men who were held there because it really thought that no one could see, no one could find out. And the lawyers actually started to bring the stories of the prisoners out of Guantanamo. But it took until 2008 for the men to get habeas corpus rights granted again by the Supreme Court, and this time they were constitutionally guaranteed. And they followed the only time in Guantanamo's history when the law has truly applied. And um, over three dozen prisoners had their habeas corpus petitions considered by the district courts in uh, the district court in, in for the District of Columbia in Washington, DC. Um, and in a majority of these cases, the um, decisions were taken by the judges that, um, that the United States had not come up with a good reason for holding these men, that they're very low evidentiary hurdle that was was required to prove that they were in any meaningful way connected to al-Qaeda or the Taliban had not been met by the United States government and these men were ordered to be released and in dozens of these cases the men were and as I say that is really the only time that the law applied at Guantanamo. What happened after that was that cynical conservative judges in the Court of Appeals in Washington DC started changing the rules in ruling after ruling um, to try and make sure that the prisoner's habeas corpus was gutted of all meaning, and they succeeded. Um, they ended up, in, in the end, with um, ruling that um, everything that the government said that purported to be evidence had to be presumptively regarded as accurate unless it could be, you know, conclusively proven that it wasn't. Um, you know, this was a, a, a bag of lies and innuendo and tortured tortured statements that purported to be evidence, but it put um, the prisoners in, in such a position that um, how are you supposed to defend yourself when you're stuck in Guantanamo with no access to anything that can help you? Um, so, you know, all, all of this sadly was happening um, uh, by the time this was all reversed and by the time that habeas was shut down was happening under President Obama. And although he had promised to close the prison, he found himself facing um, a very cynical and principled assault by the Republicans on everything that he tried to do to fulfill his promise to close Guantanamo. Um, they made it extremely difficult to release prisoners. They, um, they prevented the, the administration from releasing prisoners to certain countries. Um, having said that, I think that, that Obama failed to, um, in the end, before he left office, as commander in chief, overcome all of the obstacles that had been placed in his way um, to do something more definitive than he did to finally close the prison. But, you know, we could argue about that and many of us have about the extent to which uh, this is true and the extent to which he really had his hands tied so much. There were roughly 240 men when he took office and by the time he left, there were 41 men left. 
Um, and as I'm sure we all remember, um, when Donald Trump was president for four years, that number went down from 41 to 40. Just one man was released. Um, he was a man who'd reached a plea deal in his military commission um, trial, um, whereby in exchange for him providing evidence, he would be released to ongoing imprisonment in Saudi Arabia. And that's what happened. And Trump was told, you have to release this man. But for the rest of his presidency, he was true to the tweet that he <clears throat> sent out even before he was inaugurated. There must be no more releases from Gitmo, he said. And he wasn't interested in releasing people and he didn't have to. And that, again, is really the, the heart of the problem of Guantanamo, because this is a prison where the law still doesn't fundamentally apply. Um, if the president decides that he doesn't want you released from Guantanamo, there is nothing that anyone can do about it. And this was in spite of the fact that five of the men held had been approved for release by high level review processes established under President Obama. There was no uh, legal requirement that the men were released, so Donald Trump was not interested. Or an existing review process that he inherited from Obama was the periodic review boards. These were kind of like a parole hearing, except that normally when you have parole, it's because you've been convicted of something, whereas the men in Guantanamo haven't. But it was designed by Obama to overcome some of the opposition by allowing the prisoners to make a case that it was safe to release them. Um, Mansour is one of these people who was released as a result of this. And it led to three dozen men being released from Guantanamo who otherwise um, would not have been. Um, so, you know, the situation that we uh, now have is that suddenly the opportunity, uh, the opportunities for there to be movement on Guantanamo are back. Uh, in, if you like, we're, we're, but we're, this is Obama too. This is uh, returning to where we left off um, four years ago. And, um, and I think the big issues are that I don't think that we should doubt that there are people within the administration who would like to see Guantanamo closed because they know that it's an, an embarrassment um, and that it is, as I often call it, a legal, moral and ethical abomination. Men, most of the men held at Guantanamo are held indefinitely without charge or trial. <clears throat> there are no other circumstances in which that happens. And in fact, there are no circumstances in which that is allowed to happen in countries that claim to respect the rule of law. If you hold people indefinitely without charge or trial, that's what dictatorships do. So I, I know, and you all know, that the people in the administration know this. The problem, as was the case under Obama, is how much political capital President Biden is prepared to spend to pursue an issue that is not widely popular amongst the American public, and that continues to be something that will antagonize Republicans because they've decided that it's a great thing to uh, try and bash Democrats on whenever Democrats uh, try to be more progressive than Republicans on the Guantanamo issue. Um, but I, you know, I do very much hope that we are going to see this review process revived and that it will be meaningful because what happened over the four years of Trump is that not only one prisoner right at the end of his presidency was approved for release as a result of this parole type system. In fact, the prisoners all started boycotting it throughout Trump's four years because they had concluded correctly that it had become a sham. With President Biden in the White House, the message can go to the panels that are conducting the periodic reviews that actually what they need to be doing is trying to um, approve the release of prisoners if they can establish a case that, you know, that they shouldn't still be held. Really, people shouldn't still be held nearly 20 years after this hell hole opened unless the government has a case against them, unless the government is going to prosecute them. Um, so hopefully there'll be more Q&A later. I really don't want to go on and on. Um, as I was saying before, I'm sure that you're all actually waiting to hear from Mansour. Um, and then we're going to hear from James. And I hope that we have a very interesting Q&A session afterwards, hopefully where we can dig into a few of these issues a bit more um, about what we 
might be able to expect from President Obama and uh, uh, President Biden and what we should be demanding from him. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andy, for taking the time to, to, to be with us. Our next speech, speaker is Mansoor Adoifi. At the age of 18, Mansoor left his home in Yemen for a cultural mission to Afghanistan. He never returned. Kidnapped by warlords and then sold to the US after 9-11, he was disappeared to Guantanamo Bay, where he spent the next 15 years as prisoner number 441. He is a very talented writer and his book, Don't Forget Us Here, is about to be published in August. As a prisoner in what became known as the world's most notorious prison, Mansoor was an innocent young man emerging from its darkness. Arriving as a stubborn teenager, Mansoor survived the camp's infamous interrogation program and became a feared and hardened resistant fighter, leading prison riots and hunger strikes. Nicknamed Smiley Troublemaker, Mansoor was also a student, writer, and historian. Today, Mansoor will offer us an unprecedented window into one of the most secretive places on earth and the people, detainees and guards alike, who live there with him. Welcome, Mansoor Adoifi, and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, everyone. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Hi, everyone. <laughs> First, I would like to welcome you all. And I would like to thank you all on, be, on my behalf and behalf of all the brothers uh, who were detained at Guantanamo and the people who are still there. Uh, such meeting and such uh, activities mean, means, uh, mean a lot to the brothers and to the case. The fact is, one of the most effective tools that help us at Guantanamo the, the the media coverage. Like that's what helped us to move on in our cases, whether through the uh, uh, demonstration or through the uh, activities that all of you actually, most of you, all, all of you participated in those activities. And through the years at Guantanamo, we actually, those activities when we used to receive uh, news from our lawyers about the people who stood with us and support us at, at that time, it meant a lot to us. It meant like there is people still thinking about us be, because at Guantanamo, it was a crazy uh, journey. And I would like to start from Guantanamo. It was a place where around 50 nationalities, 20 languages, 780 men uh, end up there. Age between, maybe you'll be surprised for the first time to hear that, between one month old and the oldest detainee was 105 uh, years old. I think uh, brother Jimsy uh, met one of them there. So we ended up at Guantanamo in a place where like to totally disconnected to the world. We had no idea at all where we were and what to expect and why we were there. And those questions remain for some time, like some after like a few months, we knew we were, were at Guantanamo still like, what's Guantanamo? Like we have to figure out what's Guantanamo and where is it? But the remaining question, like the hardest question was why we were there and when till, until when and to where we will be released, especially as a Yemeni uh, background and people who are like, can that go back to their uh, home countries? It was like those challenging questions. And nobody can tell you why you were there. Guantanamo kept evolving, like started from the makeshift uh, cages to uh, shipment uh, containers to then a cement uh, uh, prison. So it, I think Guantanamo is one of the biggest cases in the 21st centuries and the trial of the, for the people who are still there or some of the people who are still there, it's one of the longest trial in history. I think it will be the longest. Guantanamo is a place or a zone with no law, no legal basis there, no protocols, nothing actually like. When we arrived there, there was no, not. they didn't know what to do with us. They didn't know how to deal with us. I'm like, there was, 
you know, like even there was some conflict between the journalists who ranked the camps. Some of them wanted to apply Geneva Convention. The other wanted like to start like extracting the information because the only reason the people were there just it is like uh, to get uh, to be interrog interrogated and get information. That's what we told. In the first three months, we went and come back actually went in hunger strike. And one of the generals, when he came to talk to us, he said, 90% of you guys should be here according to the interrogation we have conducted here. And after, after what he said, he was uh, ousted from his position and has to leave Guantanamo because like he shouldn't say said what, he, what have he said. When he moved to Camp Delta, the, and the rival of the General Miller, this is what the serious and the torture and the enhanced, enhanced inter interrogation uh, torture started there and started writing the SOP. So like still again, it was like everything is changing almost like every to the SOP, like uh, standard procedure uh, operation starts changing almost like every two weeks once. In the last 15 years when I was there, it most like has changed for almost like 84 times. Everything keeps changing. Uh, I remember when uh, brother James, he arrived as chaplain to ease cultural tension in the detention. He arrived at the time when General Miller arrived. So General, uh, General Miller had a new plan, which is turning Guantanamo into a human lab to experimenting on the uh, detainees. Like, to experiment the people there, like the way, like they tried to find a way how to integrate the people, how the people communicate, because like it was at that time, it was they headed to a, a long and big war against what they call terrorism. So they need to find a way how to integrate those people and how we will communicate, how the people operate. They, it was, so they started designing some kind of uh, rules for each camp and move, move people around, around. Like we were like, even the people who were interrogated, like it's kind of different category of age. Like, uh, like they would take like between 13 to 15 years until like seven years old, put them under the same uh, interrogation. And there was no baseless, any legal basis for anything. They started what they call uh, PRP, started as ARP. That was the first time, like they, they just class, classified everyone as enemy combatant. Then the second one, like was in 2006, again, like uh, to review the cases, it was CSR. Then when Obama came to come uh, to run the come uh, in 2000, uh, uh, Obama came to an office, they started the review in 2009 and they cleared some people. Then again, in 2014, they started what, what, what's called the PRP. So like that change, they don't have any protocol or they have any kind of system that identify who should stay or who should leave. Because actually no, 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 one, no, one, no one, like most of the time shouldn't be there in the first place. When, when Trump came to an, to an office, uh, to uh, he changed the, the PRP changed the protocol. They said now every, you have to go in front of the before the PRP and you have to admit to that all the charges the PRP will uh, will will bring against detainees. If detainees if detainee refuse, he will never be clear. So most detainees start refusing to participate in the on those PRPs. We grew up. Almost, I spent almost like 15 years of my life at Guantanamo, almost like half of my life at Guantanamo. And we tried to survive day by day. I mean, we just, I think after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mercy and our faith, we just submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything can happen, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because like taking the matter seriously, like it's not gonna help. Fighting with them is not gonna help. We try to do our best, go on hunger strike, protest, but everything will turn against us. We always told that we are launching jihad against US government. It's like, guys, we are fighting for the basic of human right in this detention. But they will they they would never listen until our voice came out of the detention and said come out to the media. Think it's start, starting to change around. Like again, it's the media and the public opinion that would affect the detention there. 
So uh, I would like to talk about some of the brothers there. I will talk uh, first of all, uh, Saifu Labratia, the oldest detainee at Guantanamo of age like 73 years old now. Uh, since I know him in 2000, I met him in 2005 in Camp 5. We were like under uh, very harsh condition and he was under uh, pressure from interrogation. Like one of the most ridiculous accusation I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> like, I remember like, they, like one of the accusations they said he was mediator, uh, mediating uh, to buy a nuclear bomb from China to Al Qaeda. Like in 2014, when the, when the interrogator came back, his, the same interrogator who was interrogating him in, in the, that time, like he was an old man, he was laughing. He said, like, just forget about it. Shasha, Shasha is a very uh, a well educated man, sense of humor, and treat everyone as his own kids. Like that way we call him uh, Shasha or father. He spent his time teaching uh, detainees and guard alike at the same time. And he told us over, all of you are like my, my kids. So in 2014, when the uh, CI interrogator came back, came back to talk to Shasha, Shasha was talking to him about like, you know, make, Shasha always like have a sense of humor. So like, I'm like, have you found anything new? Listen, just please, just don't bring those ridiculous, stupid, you know, like things. So it is a big mess, and the mess need, must be cleaned. Shasha, when I was with him, we spent his time teaching the Chinese English. We study with him English and business, and we prepare a business plan at Guantanamo. Uh, he had a, a heart disease, which like. I always like pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he lives soon. And if I get a chance, I would take his place because I would like him to leave and spend some time with his family because it was hard to see him when he got heart attack. Like it was one of the hardest moments watching our brothers dying one after another. Nine people died there. Some of them died under mysterious uh, condition. Some of them, one of them heart attack, the other one has like cancer, but there is still, we had no clear clue what happened to them. Shasha lived with us like in that block and we just, in our, all of us in the camp watching Shasha like wishing and praying nothing happened to him. And the last heart attack he got in, in January this year. And I don't know what's going to happen to him. It is, Keeping those people there indefinitely, it is a death sentence. That's what, what, what I call it. It doesn't matter because depriving someone from his freedom, this is bad stuff, it's torture. Keeping someone locked in a small box, it is torture. Those men has, have families, business. I remember Shasha, how his life destroyed his family, his business and everything in his life, many of us. And the youngest detainee at Guantanamo is Hassan bin Atash. He is, he, when he brought you to Guantanamo, he was only uh, 18 years old. He was arrested in Pakistan and sold to the CIA at the age of 16, sent to Jordan where he spent one year under torture. Then they, they sent him again to the black site in uh, Kabul, spent one year or one year and a half, then he was brought to Guantanamo. When he brought to Guantanamo, a group of them like Abdul Salam al-Hila, Ali al-Kazimi, and uh, Hassan. Ali al-Kazimi, he was severely tortured. Sometimes he always has blackout, just lost memories. Abdul Salam always like also the same thing. Hassan specifically, like they have nothing against him. He has done nothing. He gets a young boy. He was like in the restaurant and playing games and driving cars. Teenager, they told him, your only ticket out of Guantanamo just to witness against your brother. And this is the deal since 2010. Like they told him, you will never leave unless you witness against your own brother. That's it. Like also the man who left, uh, who released during the Trump administration, the same thing. He has to be guilty and he has to, I was with him. I was talking to him and translate some of his paper. 
And the general who st struck a deal with him, he told him, you have to admit to those charges. One of it, the attack, one of the uh, uh, ship in, uh, in Yemen, uh, uh, in Adel. He said, but I have no idea. He said, we need to give our fr uh, uh, friends something. So he was forced to witness against people he just to strike a deal because they don't have any evidence to persecute those people. So they trying to tennis against each other. And this is the only way of those uh, people. This is just examples. Mu'ad al-Alawi, one of the artists, he is a teacher. Khalid, also an artist, singer, teacher. Those, my brothers and my friends, we live together. There is no different, no accusation. People want to live their life. They work hard. They try to uh, study English. They uh, uh, try to prepare their, their life, life after Guantanamo. But as I told you, there is no protocol. There is no set of system that people get released. It, if you get, if your name comes to the PRBs, you get lucky. If <laughs> I remember during my PRP, I was told, listen, you have to make them like you. I remember when I was reading one of the books, Hunger Game, the same thing when the people went to the arena, they said, if you want to get sponsored by the public, you have to make them like you. It's the same thing. But even the PRP process changing like every time. So it's like become harder and harder to release uh, people. There is people still there who was clear in 2009, two of them. So they weren't lucky. They weren't like made by any delegation and they weren't sent to any country. They just stayed, stayed at Guantanamo, the symbols of that. So uh, I would like to talk to also about, sorry to bring those important cases, the hunger strike where we started the first month when we arrived at Guantanamo. There is brothers at Guantanamo for the last 15 years, Ghassan al Atebi, for the, over 10 years, Ahmed Rabbani, also like over 10 years, not just in hunger strike, in force feeding. Even in those force feeding, those doctors, some of the doctors, turn the hunger strike to a tool of torture. Sometimes they would stop feeding the detainees until the until like they, they went to the brink of, of death and they were set feeding again. So they tried to force him to, to stop the, uh, the, hunger, the, the hunger strike that happened with us over and over again. It's like it was war between us and the doctors. We, we tried to explain to them, nobody wants to die, but we have no other way. Like it's peaceful protests and we need, something has to done with our cases. But even our hunger strike were turned against us. It wasn't hard to, hunger, to, go, to even to do hunger strike. We had to spend, 40 to 50 to 60 days just on water until you reach the point where they will feed you. So they become very smart in, in mastering the, uh, the force feeding. Not the detainees, the one who just uh, suffer at Guantanamo. I watched many guards who uh, also suffer and conflicted to carry their orders because when they came to work at Guantanamo, they found the situation when they mix with us and talk to us and they spend some of their life with us talking to us. It, like many of them like to us, this is the wrong. We are sorry, but they have to carry their orders. I think one of them is Jim C. I remember when he tried to help us when he arrived at Guantanamo during Miller, it was like really intense uh, mistreatment and it was like the beginning of the uh, enhanced interrogation technique. We were complaining to James as like Chaplin, and he tried to help, but uh, General, uh, General, uh, General uh, Miller view him as obstacle. So simply they accuse him of <laughs> as a spy. Like we were surprised and shocked. Chaplin, like captain, like the first army Chaplin arrived to want, uh, 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 so it's in the first story. So accused as a uh, spy, it was like shocked all of us. Even we, we sent letters to the uh, Canada administration, to the ICRC, tried to, to defend this man, but nothing happened. So as Guantanamo, uh, it keep changing and like, it was unclear what's going to happen to us there. And this is one of the hardest thing, being there, you don't know until when what's going to happen to you. And 
being isolated of your family and just every time you think what the news I will get. Like many of us receive news, losing families, wives, kids. And the more you stay at that place, the more you become, we said not weaker, it's just devastated you over and over again. One of the things I noticed at Guantanamo when I was like, when we moved in 2010, when they, when, when we, after they closed the, the solitary, solitary confinement, we will move to the communal living. I noticed that we were talking about the previous years we spent at the detention because before Guantanamo, we had no life together. So we started, when we mixed with our brothers, we started to constru construct uh, memories and life together. When we met again in the community living, we start relive those memories over and over again because this is what we have in common. And I found that we are going deeper and deeper in our, in our prison. And this is one of the things when like being uh, isolated or disconnected to the world. You think you have some freedom, but at the same time, you start with your brothers. When you meet them after years, you remember like the hunger strike, you remember those problems, you remember like when those were talking our, uh, taking our clothes, when we were like, well, food punishment just, and when the year passed, we start remembering our brothers, the one who died, the one who their names were scratched on the, on the metal, on the doors, on. So we started fight at Guantanamo for our freedom from the first, from the very first month. And we continued and like trying to bring attention to the world, to our case. It just was a simple message. We are human here. And even through our arts, through our protest, but even all of, in spite of that, always the US government view our activities as jihad, as, acti uh, as um, activities of terrorism within the camp itself and always being carried there to justify their response to the, to, uh, uh, to, uh, in the camp. Uh, so those, those activities like in the media and such activities, it helps a lot. It helps to uh, keep Guantanamo uh, case alive and push forward to, close, uh, to, uh, to be closed. And I hope and pray that Biden will honor his uh, uh, promise to close it. And, and I hope it's not gonna happen again, but from what I can see now Guantanamo is everywhere. I can see it either like China, I can see it in Saudi Arabia. I can see it in UAE where like, what is like, one of the cases I want to talk about today, it's like living in the shadow of, in the shed, the shadow of Guantanamo. There is some brothers who still, who were released to uh, United Arab Emirates in 2016. They still in jail there. And we have been trying for the last five years to get any contact with them through lawyers, through any uh, human rights organization, through anyone, but we couldn't. Like, I got some news from the families. When they arrived at that place, they spent 70 days blindfolded and shackled to the, to the wall. Four Afghanis were released, I think two years ago, one year and a half. One of those, men died only a few months after he uh, died and what he wh when i talked to him he said wallahi i had been I, I was detained by the soviet union i was detained in bagram in kandahar and in guantanamo i haven't seen worse than the treatment in the ua prison two men totally lost their minds like abdel qadir and uh, bilal abu Sam. totally they just crazy so those men were allowed to talk to their families or have connection to the lawyers or to the, to the ICRC, no one is still there. We have also other brothers who still live, live in the stigma of Guantanamo in Kazakhstan, in Albania. And because when Trump came to, uh, uh, to the White House in 2016 or 17, he just, shut down the office which was responsible of the, the release detainees. And many governments, they felt they're not obliged to do anything. So 
it was like a treaty between the United States government and those countries. So everything has changed. It is like there was like a setup of program for rehabilitation and integration, but nothing happened at all. I would like to thank you all for everything you have done, especially Andy uh, and, uh, and all of you for everything you have done for us there. And it's our duty now to continue the fight until those people get released and to help those who still, even though listen, and still like suffer after life after Guantanamo. And I uh, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I get my freedom early. <laughs> so should I like, and I, I was given this chance also to heal my brothers and in any way I could. And uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, my book is coming in the, August, in the upcoming summer. It is called, Don't Forget Us Here. It cover almost like 15 years of life of Guantanamo. It's not cover even like the everything that I tried to cover the detainees life, the guards, the animals, the, uh, the, uh, the relationship between detainees and guards. And uh, I hope you will enjoy, enjoy reading this book. And again, I thank you all. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Thank you so very much, Mansoor. I know I can barely, barely speak. Um, it, it was so kind of you to uh, take, give us your time and your experience. We really, really appreciate it. James E. is a former captain in the United States Army. Shortly after graduating from West Point, he converted to Islam. He was one of the first Muslims to enter the U.S. Army Chaplain Corps. He was assigned to Guantanamo Prison in 2003. This was the beginning of a chilling and painful awakening that is documented in his book. Captain Yee's role as chaplain meant it was his job to advocate for the free exercise of worship. Captain Yee expressed his outrage as a chaplain, as a Muslim, and as a soldier witnessing the violation of human rights. After 10 months at Guantanamo, Captain Yee was arrested in Jacksonville, Florida while on a two week leave for carrying suspicious documents. He was shackled and blindfolded and soundproof earmuffs were placed over his ears. The same sensory dep deprivation tactics inflicted on prisoners at Guantanamo, he said. He was taken to a U.S. Navy brig in Charleston, South Carolina, where he spent 76 days in solitary confinement. Captain Yee was ultimately charged with sedition, aiding the enemy, spying, espionage, and failure to obey a general order. He faced the death penalty. And yet, no evidence against him was ever presented. In 2004, all criminal charges were dropped. He resigned from the military, was granted an honorable discharge, and even received a medal for exceptional meritorious conduct. Mr. Yi said he credits his survival to his faith as a Muslim, his ethnicity, he had been referred to as that Chinese Taliban, and his patriotism. Thank you so much for joining us today, James. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, first, first, I'd like to say that it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to, to be with everyone here today to share my experience as the chaplain who served at the prison camp in Guantanamo Bay back in 2002 and 2003. Um, I know Mansoor and I know Andy. Uh, we often communicate about these issues and uh, you know, I've known Andy for, for a long time since, uh, since he's been advocating and blogging about Guantanamo. And more recently, Mansoor, connected with Mansoor when he was released. And uh, it's an honor to, to, share, to share the stage, so to speak, with, with these two great individuals. Uh, today, I, I just wanna share a little bit about my experience at Guantanamo from the perspective as a military chaplain, a Muslim chaplain who served in Guantanamo at the prison camp, and as such became a person who, uh, who was a witness 
to the abuse and torture at Guantanamo. And uh, I'm coming from, from that perspective. Uh, but before I do so, I want to address some of the things that, that uh, Mansour had said uh, and respond. He had mentioned that uh, the youngest prisoner, uh, he mentioned the name of who he said was the youngest prisoner, but who, who him, I think he mentioned was like 17 or 18. But in fact, there were actually at there were actually three prisoners who were younger than that, who were not held in the general population and perhaps Mansour didn't even know that they were there at the time because they were separated. These three individuals were 12 to 14 years old, boys. There were three individuals who were 12 to 14 years of age from Afghanistan that were held in a facility known as Camp Iguana. Uh, their names were Muhammad Ismail, Naqibullah, and Asadullah. Uh, and when we look at the records, actually some of the organizations, some of the human rights organizations have, have documented that, that in terms of international law, juveniles, juvenile enemy combatants as they were called in Guantanamo, if you're saying juvenile under the age of 18, there were at least 15 individuals in Guantanamo who were under the age of 18, possibly 21, possibly 21 individuals. There were uh, six individuals who perhaps could have been uh, younger than 18 when they arrived, but it's been documented that there are at least 15 who were under the age of 18. And then, I, and then including in, the, in those were the three individuals who were 12 to 14. And at Guantanamo, what, what had happened was if you, if an individual was 15 years or older, they were held in general population. So these three individuals who were 14 and under were held separately. And as far as I know, none of the other prisoners at Guantanamo at the time were aware that there were prisoners this young that were being held elsewhere in the camps of Guantanamo. That, that's one, one, one thing. The second thing I want to I want to address is Mansour talked about how they were punished when they went on hunger strike, and and when it got so bad that the hunger strike uh, got to the point where the command, where the medical command, would force feed the individuals to keep them alive so they wouldn't die from hunger striking, uh, and and that process itself was torturous and where. A, a, a tube was, was, was lubed with petroleum jelly or some other type of lubricant, inserted through the nostril into the, into the throat and force fed with, with a milkshake type uh, uh, drink like Ensure, right? So just that process itself was, was torturous. However, it's, uh, it's been documented that, that there were some cases in which I believe uh, uh, I'm not sure if it was either in, in uh, where these these incidences occur, but there were incidences which I have read about, which were called rectal rehydration, where instead of inserting the tube through the nose, it was inserted through the rectum. And at one point, I, I even read a, a, an incident where they used uh, not a liquid, but some type of solid food to do that, and it was it was hummus, right? In my view, this is this is this is rape, right? This is sexual assault, not a force feeding technique to keep someone alive because they're hunger striking, right? Um, I actually had to do my research to find out where where these incidences occur, if they indeed actually happened at Guantanamo or elsewhere, like in in, this, in the CIA black sites, where the handful of, of prisoners who were still at Guantanamo were held were five years prior to being brought to Guantanamo. But from my perspective, uh, as a chaplain and as a witness to the torture and abuse, um, my focus at Guantanamo was religious support, providing religious rights to the prisoners at Guantanamo. Because ultimately, that's the primary role of a chaplain in the US military, to protect the free exercise of worship, to protect the religious rights of individuals who serve in the military, of individuals who serve on a military installation, and of individuals who may be incarcerated or imprisoned by the US military. Indeed, that was the situation in Guantanamo. So my primary role was that of protecting the religious rights 
of these Muslim prisoners in Guantanamo. And no doubt because I was a Muslim chaplain, that was the reason why I was chosen to go to Guantanamo and be, and be, and be the chaplain there. Uh, but let's look at some of the things that happened, the abuse of prisoners in Guantanamo with regard to religion. And I've often stated that religion in Guantanamo was used as a weapon against the prisoners in persecuting these men, religious persecution. And it could be as simple as, for example, when Muslims in Guantanamo were making their prayers, guards would perhaps stomp down the corridors to interrupt or to, to make loud noises while the men were praying. Or maybe they would throw rocks or stones at the, pray, at the prisoners while they were making their prostrations in prayer. Right? Or it could be as simple as the guard force turning off the water prior to prayer. Because as Muslims, we wash ritually before prayer and then we pray. So sometimes the guards would, would intentionally turn the water spigots off so that the prisoners could not wash before the prayer. And this would always end up in the disturbances, the riots, the protests from the prisoners because guards would, would do this intentionally, right? Because they knew that Muslims wash before prayer, right? Um, it could also be as simple as when I was able to ensure that the call to prayer was made five times a day at Guantanamo. The persecution could be as simple as when that call to prayer was being made over the loudspeaker, guards would, would yell or scream or play music, right? Or mock the call to prayer, right? These are just simple ways in which how religion was being used as a weapon in Guantanamo, but things could get worse. For example, at one point, the, uh, the commander of the detention operation, who I directly reported to, he was a colonel. He wanted to implement a forced beard shaving as punishment for prisoners. And at one point, he came to me and said what he wanted to do was he wanted to implement this as a disciplinary measure, especially for prisoners who would be forcefully extracted from their cell for whatever reason because that process entailed the guard, the, the, the riot force coming and responding by spraying pepper spray and then dragging that prisoner around. So he tried, the commander tried to make a, make, make a, reason, a reasoning that because that, pers that, that prisoner was doused with, with pepper spray, that out of, out of hygiene purposes, that those individuals would need to have their beards shaven because that pepper spray would be in that in their hair, right? But in actuality, it was a, a way to to try and punish prisoners, because as Muslims, some some believe that it's a an obligatory practice to have to wear a beard as a Muslim male. And by and large, most all the prisoners uh, followed that practice. But even worse than that, I heard the stories from the prisoners themselves of some of the things that occurred in the interrogation rooms. For example, a prisoner complained once about how inside one of the interrogation rooms was marked on the floor of this interrogation room, a large circle, which was fashioned uh, as a symbol, a satanic symbol. And it was understood by the interrogators that Muslims who believe in the oneness of God, a pure monotheistic belief in God, that the Muslim prisoners held strong to this belief in one God and in an attempt to break prisoners from this faith would force that prisoner shackled in the center of what was a satanic circle and tried to force Muslims to bow down and prostrate in the center of this satanic circle while the interrogators would scream at them that Satan is your God now, not Allah, not God the Almighty. Right? So this was using our faith, using religious belief in one God against the prisoner by forcing them in, in, in a, in a, in, to prostrate 
in a satanic circle. That was that was one method or one tactic. Another another would be the the the, the attacking of of very orthodox practice where Muslim uh, male and female limit physical contact out of respect for each other. A Muslim male who refuses to have physical contact with a female does that out of respect for not only himself, but also his female family members, like his wife or his daughters or his aunts, right? That physical contact is reserved for immediate family, a person's spouse, not an unmarried, not another woman or female who's not married to him. Right? The interrogators attack this practice by em employing female interrogators. I believe they were female interrogators who would perform what you might call scandalous lap dances on the shackled prisoner who sat in their chair, unable to resist, right? There were complaints that I received in which prisoners uh, complained how female interrogators would grab the genitals of Muslim male prisoners in the course of an interrogation session, right? These being done because they understood these interrogators, whether they were military or civilian interrogators, understood that practice of limited physical contact between the sexes. I recently saw the, the, the film, The Mauritanian, in which they showed some of the interrogation techniques. So one of the scenes had the, the, the woman, you know, straddled over uh, the prisoner performing, performing this type of, of lap dance, so to speak, or, or sexual uh, uh, assault type conduct on the prisoner, right? And then a, 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 another way in which religion was being used, something that hit the media uh, shortly after I left Guantanamo, and that was the issue of the desecration of the Quran. So military and civilian interrogation understood the belief of Muslims in how we respect the Quran and, how, and what we believe of the Quran, that we hold that the words of the Quran are the, the literal words of God, the literal words of Allah, and that even in our homes, we put the Quran on the highest shelf in our home out of respect and reverence. The desecration of the Quran was, was, was used, the abusing of the Quran in front of a shackled prisoner or in the in, in the course of a cell search in the cell blocks was done because they understood our reverence and respect for the, 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 what we believe is the words of God. So this is how religion was being used as a weapon. And those were the try, things that I tried to address to the command uh, because it, it's in my view as a chaplain, it was, it was, it was unethical. Uh, however, the, the perspective that the command took was that prisoners had no rights, no legal rights, and certainly no religious rights in Guantanamo, and that perhaps by bringing me as a Muslim chaplain to Guantanamo was, was perhaps a show or a display to try and show the world that we were actually being respectful of religion in Guantanamo when the opposite was the case. Uh, I want to conclude here and, and, and allow that time for the, the questions and answers. Uh, but I hope you you are able to see where I'm I was coming from as a as a, a a chaplain in the U.S. military in my role in trying to protect uh, and preserve the free exercise of worship for prisoners at Guantanamo. Thank you. Thank you, James. That was uh, extremely powerful. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, what must be very difficult for both you and Mansoor. Um, we will have our question and answer period next, and that will be led by Ann Barron, Cheryl, and Judy. Uh, Julie, pardon me. Hi, my name is Ann Barron. I'm with the Peace Resource Center of San Diego. And I'll be facilitating the question and answer period. We've had some really uh, disturbing um, 
just disturbing memories of what has happened at Guantanamo. We also are going to be reflecting on the, on the basically how these practices in Guantanamo are now prevalent in the US as well. Um, so that's the, the flashback that we've had from the US military practices abroad now coming back home. And we'll be reflecting on that as well. But we also have a question from Donna Buell. And what she is asking is, how would you characterize the forces, those entities, the institutions that kept Obama from closing Guantanamo? So we remember that this is the first time, uh, this is not the first time that we have tried to shut down Guantanamo. It is a blight on the, on the I don't want to say the reputation of the United States, because I don't really want to get into what the rep reputation of the United States is these days but it definitely is a stain on human rights. Um, and so if this is a question to any panelists that would like to um, address it, how would you characterize the forces that kept o President Obama from closing Guantanamo? Yeah, well, I, d I, think, the, I think the Republicans were extremely um, cynical. I think they worked out, they uh, had nothing to, to lose by bashing everything that, uh, that President Obama made um, to try and close Guantanamo. Um, and, you know, the, the difference now is that Obama, I have to say, sadly, rather squandered his first, because that was the only time he actually had a majority of Congress and mm -hmm. lost it in his midterms. And in his second term, um, he was up against, um, you know, a Republican majority. Whereas at the moment, um, President Biden is in a very good position of actually having a majority in Congress. Um, but also a matter, I think, of um, some things may need doing with Congress, other things, other things don't. It isn't as though everything has to be done through Congress. So what he has to do and what we have to encourage the Democrats to do is to believe how right and appropriate and it is that Guantanamo is closed. Because otherwise, all the negative voices start coming about how you're threatening our national security and all of this rubbish. Because, you know, as we've heard so eloquently from Mansour, the truth about Guantanamo is that although a few people there have been accused of serious crimes, and very serious in the case of 9 11, the vast majority of the men who have been held there were never were. And actually, even of the men who are still held, there are so many of, the, of those people who simply do not pose a threat to the United States. So it's, um, it's trying to work with the positive aspects of why Guantanamo needs closing to overcome the negative stories that will always be played by people who want to portray anyone who wants to close Guantanamo as being soft on terrorism. Right. Um, you know, when that, that clearly is not the case. If someone has allegedly committed a crime and can be prosecuted for it, should happen. But we're still stuck in the position where, as Mansour was talking about, so I Fuller, the eldest, the oldest prisoner in Guantanamo, a man with love for everybody, mistakenly implicated in an Al Qaeda plot, um, is still held at Guantanamo and has had several heart attacks. We are still in the position where people who are no more significant than Mansour was. People in Guantanamo who are charismatic, who are artistic, who are religious, who are um, working for the, the, you know, the betterment of the conditions in which their fellow prisoners are held, are regarded simply because of that as a threat, and therefore the authorities don't want to release them. Um, I think you know, the more that we can put across the stories of, um, of the people who are still held, even though they're, they're, they're insignificant. I think that that really helps as well. So the, the narrative I'm hearing is also very important in changing the narrative with the Republicans. Um, and I was thinking, you reminded me as you were talking of the Poor People's Campaign, which uses the narrative, the, the focus on a moral versus an immoral. Uh, government. And so it's it's the moral campaign, the, the right thing to do. Is that what I right. hear you saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, there's a lot to think about. Uh, it's politics as well. Um, I was wondering if any of the other panelists would like to add to that, what was said already. 
James, did you want to speak? Yeah. Uh, so let me, uh, let me make some commentary on this. And this is, this is very personal to me because after I got out of the military, when Barack Obama ran for president as a constitutional law expert who promised to close Guantanamo, I supported him fully to the extent that I was elected in Washington state as a national delegate so that he would become the primary candidate for the 2008 election campaign over Hillary Clinton. And my support was based on his promise to close Guantanamo. Uh, the questioner asked you know, what, what do we think of the forces that prevented um, Barack Obama from closing Guantanamo? And with regard to the Republicans, my view is that the Democrats on Guantanamo are just as weak as the Republicans. Uh, because when President Obama tried to bring prisoners to, from Guantanamo to the United States to try them in federal courts, and he, he was successful in doing that with one prisoner, many of the Democrats also said, not in my backyard are you bringing Guantanamo prisoners to my state. In addition, they helped pass the legislation which would prevent President Obama from using federal funding to set up a new prison in the United States or to, or to bring prisoners to, to, to the United States from Guantanamo. So often we saw the case where President Obama blamed Congress for his failure to close Guantanamo. So, and I believe like in the first two years of the Obama administration, uh, I almost wanna say that he had control, that the Democrats also had control of, of Congress until it, it, it swung back to, to control other Republicans like two years later, right, at the midterms, right? But I think in the very beginning, I think, I think the Dem, Dems had, had also had control of, 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 of the House and Senate uh, when Obama was first elected. But President Bush opened Guantanamo with an executive action. So I believe that it's within the authority, within the power of the president, and and then President Obama to close Guantanamo with executive action, regardless of the legislation that was passed. And that, that's actually an option that perhaps President Biden has to, to attempt to close Guantanamo, bring prisoners to the United States, try them in federal courts, and then see if uh, that would stand up in, in the courts on, on the basis that if that's not done, then we're then then the, then the U.S. is being unjust and holding prisoners unlawfully, uh, indefinitely without charge, right? But this is this is listen to this quote that President Biden said that that Vice President then Vice President in 2009 at the Munich Security Conference, soon after President Obama was elected and Biden was the Vice President at the Munich Security Conference, Biden was quoted as saying. We will uphold the rights of, 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 of those who we bring to justice and we will close the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay. Right. So the broken promise of the Obama administration really now is in the Biden court and it's, it's really on him to carry through with what Obama's promise to close Guantanamo and take the next step and himself do it. But I believe that, that President Biden today can do it with an executive action. Uh, thanks for that, James. Can I just add something? Can you hear me? Please, do. I can. Yes, please do. Um, I mean, it's interesting that you know, even eight years ago, there were some people thinking that there were really three categories of prisoner at Guantanamo. There were the men who should be released, there were the men who should be charged, and there were men who could continue to be held as something to do with the laws of war. Not that the Geneva Conventions have ever applied but the, 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 this kind of battlefield context that you can hold people until the end of hostilities, which has always kind of run parallel to the illegal story of Guantanamo, because you can take people off a battlefield and you can hold them until the end of hostilities. I think the interesting thing now with 40 men held at Guantanamo and with Joe Biden as president is that it's now nearly 20 years. Let's all of us remember that on January the 11th next year, the prison yes. would have been open for 20 years. Yeah. Now, apart from anything else, we appear to be in the endless war that the Bush administration mm -hmm. said we were in, a war that spans the entire globe 
and that has no end. Um, that, that seems to me to be totally unacceptable. But it's also unacceptable to have this notion that you can continue holding people indefinitely without charging them until the end of hostilities when it's such an extraordinary amount of time. There are 12 of the 40 men who are um, charged or have been through something to do with the military commission process. It's kind of a separate discussion that we need to have as to whether the military commissions are such a broken system yes. that they don't work, which is what I think, and mm -hmm. that anyone who's going to be charged should be tried in federal court. But I think that what we need to say to the, to the Biden administration is, you're not going to try prisoners you have to start making the arrangements now to release mm -hmm. everybody else who's still held. That's 28 men. And, you know, there, there are allegedly um, serious charges against some of these other men who have yes. never been officially charged. But I think it's time to say, if you're not going to charge them, let us start making resettlement proposals for sending these people back to their home countries, to third countries, because if that, if that is required, because they can't be returned to their homes. But to finally do away with this notion that one component of Guantanamo is indefinite imprisonment without charge or trial, because that has never been acceptable. And with 20 right. years coming up, I would love to see the prison closed. If we can't get it closed by January, at least to have repudiated the notion that there is something acceptable about indefinite imprisonment without charge or trial, because there isn't. So uh, that's actually a wonderful segue. Uh, we have time for a few more questions, but we are going to have a call to action to Congress after this, demanding that our senators support President Biden's work to close down, shut down Guantanamo. And you just gave us some wonderful talking points for that <laughs> call to action. So thank you for that. Uh, we do have time for, uh, I would say, three more questions, perhaps. And so, uh, Julie, I'm going to pass it on to you. Did you receive any questions in the chat? Yes, I did. I, did. Um, I have a question that was a, actually a clarification for Munsoor. Um, says, I thought I heard him say there was a date detainee there as young as one month old. Was that misheard or can you respond to that? No, it's actually, that was happening there like in 2002. When I moved from the solitary confinement, solitary confinement to black, uh, eco black, I found an Afghani man. Like I was talking to a brother that said, like everyone, like when he was taken to the hospital to see to see his son, I said, like I asked my friends, "Are you serious?" One month he said, "Yes." They brought him. They suspected he was a son of Osama bin Laden <sighs> because the boy was uh, the father and the boy was injured. So like they strapped him up and someone sold him to the CIA in the, um, Pakistan. They told them this is related to Osama bin Laden. So the boy spent his first year at the hospital at, at uh, Guantanamo. And this is one of the like hurt us, hurt us most. Like, that would give him like either every two weeks or one month a visit to see his son there and just perform behind the glass and so on. Uh -huh. And he was released like, I think in 2003, he was released. This is one of the things like still unknown at Guantanamo, even like, I kept asking my brothers over and over again, like, are you sure? And like, yes, they said, we are sure about the story. So like, Adam's like, I imagine things. No, they said, no. So I want to do it in my, in, in my uh, book too. Like, as I told you before, Guantanamo serve no purpose, no security, no safety for anyone. It's a waste of not lives, money, time. Imagine now like 40, 40 detainees, a hundred, like 1,700 1, 1, guards, Detained, like, what's the purpose of Guantanamo from the, what serves, what serves from the beginning to now? Does Guantanamo make America feel safer? It's just a big must need to be clean, uh, uh, clean. And I hope, I hope like it will be uh, closed. I mean, there's, there's other like stories, horrible stories, like just one of the simplest I want people to know. I think Jim C. E. so it was my neighbor, 105 years old, like, even I have photo of, of this guy. I think Andy knows about, about the story too. So like, it is just a crazy, a crazy place. It, you know, like, <sighs> there's not a lot to talk about. Thank you very much. And I have another question, if I can find it here, um, which actually kind of is related to what you were saying about how crazy it is there. And, and it was, what do people who were in Gitmo or what did people think in Gitmo 
as the reasons for their detention? What did their family members think? Was that ever, I mean, discussed or whatever? That was from Paul. You know, are you asking me? Yes, because <laughs> you were there. For us there, as I told you, we lived there, even the interrogations, we were interrogated with different CIA, FBI, NSA, and other branches, even like other delegations from other countries who are also interrogated, interrogating us like from other Arab countries or other countries, we had no idea what were they looking for. Like, for example, I was accused to be Al-Qaeda general, uh, Nile of insider, and they said I was, I was a general close to Osama bin Laden, and I was taken to the black side. I was tortured, even Guantanamo, I was in uh, sleep deprivation, and you're like, <laughs> I have like different file and different cases. And I'd like, you know what, just pick up one case and stick to it. <laughs> like, it's it's like said guy, like they said, no, you are, no, you are not, you weren't, you weren't that like an Egyptian guy. They said you're mistaken. Then they said, no, no, you, you were close to Osama bin Laden. By 2014, they said uh, in my PRP, they said, uh, he didn't play any significant role to Al-Qaeda. No one from Al-Qaeda uh, leaders or Al-Qaeda member recognized him as part of Al-Qaeda. After I was killed by the PRP, a colonel from the Navy, he said, Mansour, I would like to say something to you. I would like to apologize for wanting to go for the longest and official. But we simply, we cannot say to the world, we held innocent men for 15 years. Mm -hmm. We had to do something at least. And I was like, I told him this is hurt more than anything, you know? And like one of my accusations, they said in the uh, secret, uh, secret um, accusation, they said he is smart and he has the ability of leading and gathering uh, people. Like, and they, like our behavior in the detention, this is how they judge us there. It's not what we have be before going because they have nothing against us. And over and over again, like, even when I arrived here in Serbia, I was accused the same thing, you are Al-Qaeda general. I said, look, I have been there 15 years. Do you think American CIA and FBI is stupid to send a general to Serbia? But we have now Guantanamo become a part of us. We have to live with it. So we know ourselves, it just, you know, sometimes we just, we don't, we, we stopped thinking about it for a long time because it doesn't make any sense. We're laughing at the interrogator. So like today I am a general, tomorrow I will be a son Laden. Do you think, you know, even the interrogators, they said, we didn't know, we just have some question to ask you. But it was purpose of Guantanamo was to, to train interrogators, to train uh, guards. It was also like, as I told you, it was a lab to experiment uh, on, on, on people there, like in simple words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mansour. And you were making me think that it that it is basically just in a nutshell, they had no idea who almost everybody was when they arrived at Guantanamo. I mean, the instructions that were handed down to the people on the ground in Afghanistan were that every single Arab has to be sent to Guantanamo. No excuses. So people like Mansour were arriving at Guantanamo. They didn't know who they had. The purpose then was to establish that they the opposite was true, that actually everybody they got were the worst of the worst, because that's what their leaders were telling them. So then interrogations were based around finding out how to present everybody as somebody significant, not to accept that they weren't anybody significant. And then once you've done that, then you've labeled these people as so significant that that, that puts all the obstacles up as to why they should be released. It's kind of catch 22 ing in all kinds of horrible, horrible ways. And this is what, you know, the United States government doesn't want to admit how colossal their mistakes were at yes. every level, because it's really shameful and embarrassing. It really is. But, you know, as hopefully everyone tonight has heard, when you hear from Mansour, when you hear from the people subjected to this absurd but horrible scenario, you know, the impacts are on their lives, but it is, I think, completely true that this was a failure of intelligence on the most colossal scale. So I'm going to interrupt then. Um, this is actually a great point, because um, actually I'm, I'm feeling that it was done by design. Um, so that's a whole other conversation. 
yeah. about how things have raveled out or unraveled. We do have a request. Uh, we, we really don't have uh, time for more questions, but we have a request from uh, two students who want the speakers on today's panel to come and participate in a, a peace discussion they're going to have at their school. So I can message you privately on that and put you in touch with those students if you're able to participate or at least respond to them. That would be great. And I know, um, Cheryl, did you get any questions? I know that. Um, I did get some. OK. So I think what we can do is to send the questions uh, directly to the panelists since we have run out of time for this section um, okay. and then send the, the responses back to those who've asked the questions. And we can also post them on the, uh, Facebook. And I also wanted to point out that uh, we have posted into the chat, there is a Facebook group that we're putting together to generate an activated group that's gonna work with President Biden and make sure that we can finally close Guantanamo. We're very fortunate Andy's gonna sing his song live for us, Fighting for Injustice. I'm gonna, uh, I'll keep it short and sweet then because we're, you know, there's still so much to be done, obviously, from certain things. But I'll play a verse and a chorus of it. And then, um, you know, I hope you like it. <laughs> Look at this world in decline Despite all the victories that were fought for Centuries spent struggling for the vote And for our right to health care and education running out of time our politicians are turned into pimps and our NHS is being choked and there are no jobs for the young and this broken nation that's why we say if you ain't fighting injustice, you're living on the dark side, oh yeah. If you ain't fighting injustice, you're living on the dark side, oh yeah. Thank you, Andy. And now we will do our call to action, led by Ann and Cheryl. Hi, everybody. So this is the call of action. This is really where we take everything we just heard, um, the heartache, the sorrow, the pain, um, the knowledge that this is, this is part of our country um, as a democracy. Uh, it's unbelievable. So the call to action now. Hello, Sharon. Yeah. Um, will I be reading my story? Yes. Okay. So our call to action actually begins with a with blowback. And the blowback is it's a book that was written that explains how all of the US policies, all of our practices, all of our covert actions around the world are blowing back onto US citizens and residents, people living here on the homeland. Um, in ways that we hadn't anticipated. The book is great, it's called Blowback, and Cheryl Canson is here to talk about the blowback from the torture in prisons to here in her own life here in San Diego. So Cheryl, uh, welcome and, and we look forward to hearing your story. Thank you, Anne. Um, I'm Cheryl Canton and I'll be reading, I had to write down because my mind, there's so much. So I had to write it down. Okay, I'm Cheryl Canton and I'm here to shine a light on another torturous injustice and human rights violation happening across our nation and in all jails, prisons and detention centers. 
It is when a mentally ill person is sentenced to incarceration in one of those state institutions aforementioned and the mental health treatment is inadequate. I can attest to this because I have two mentally ill sons that were receiving mental health treatment at Young and when experiencing a manic episode were sentenced to prison without any consideration of their mental health history nor continued mental health needs. COVID has added another layer of trauma to the mentally ill incarcerated uh, of our loved ones. Now I'm aware that we all are suffering traumatic effects of COVID, but some are better able to adapt than others. Since COVID, my son incarcerated, one of them has been brutally beaten by prison guards at New Folsom State Prison twice. He contracted COVID and thank God has healed, but without, any, without much treatment for COVID, just temperature checks. COVID affects COVID affecting packages, food, mail, phone calls, and visits, and mental health treatment down to the mentally ill person uh, asking for help, which shows lack of education, has shown detrimental for my mentally ill son and countless others like him. I have made several attempts at getting my son released due to COVID, but requests were denied in spite of his pre-existing medical conditions. COVID has brought on psychosis for my son. He has said, mom, I've been thinking about killing myself. He needs to be restored and help to regain balance. Mm -hmm. This didn't happen. My mentally ill son was brutally beaten by prison guards on January 23rd, 2021 in response to his psychosis. Even though he was in handcuffs, he's being accused of being provoking and this is in the notes, so they say it's justified. He was taken to the hospital to receive emergency services for his nose being broken and fractured bones in his face, having to have reconstructive surgery. To add insult to injury, he was returned to the prison and placed in isolation. I was scheduled to visit last weekend, but the link was not sent to me by my son and so I was unable to visit him. And I fear that that was intentional. It's, it said to me that I did not see, need to see the appearance of my son. My son should not be alone for fear of retaliation uh, by CDCR. And he's more able to be successful at committing suicide. I know that less eyes on him means no witness and he's left to his own devices. It's not a good thing. I, we fear for my loved one's life and I'm trying to have him move to receive treatment to be nursed to health. I am founded, I have founded an initiative, Treat Me, Don't Mistreat Me. The me is MI for mental illness where I advocate that mentally ill people deserve treatment not to be thrown in cages and tortured and violently attacked, assaulted by prison guards. I've included in the chat the Facebook page, Treat Me, Don't Mistreat Me, and also a petition that I'm asking my people support this action as what affects one of us affects us all. And I'm a firm believer that what we hear, what we see with our senses makes us responsible to respond. Thank you. My heart goes out to you. I, I, and I know, Cheryl, that you have a lot of people um, who are rooting for you and for your sons, and we're here to support you. So there is a petition, there is a phone call, there, there is a lot of work being done here on the ground to support prisoners who've been unjustly prisoned in the US system. And we see the connections, so deeply see the connections between what's happening in our military prisons and how that blows back into our civilian prisons. So we're gonna start the call to action. And what you're gonna need for this call to action is your cell phone. So grab your cell phones and you are gonna make a phone call to, to the US Capitol switchboard and ask to speak with your Senator. Of course, today is Saturday and they're not there, but you can leave a voicemail. After you leave a voicemail, feel free to follow up with an email as well. Now we have some suggested text to you for the call to action. I'm gonna share my screen, but feel free also from what you've heard from today to add to the call to action 
um, you're speaking to your representative, you're telling her or him uh, what you need to see them do to make sure that we're defending everybody's human rights. And that's what this is all about, right? Everyone's human rights, everyone is human. Um, so this call to action cannot, it starts today, it actually started a while back, but it continues today and it can't end today. So we will continue to advocate, push for, demand, interrupt, interfere with until we get Guantanamo shut down. Guantanamo is a symbol of all of, of what is wrong with US, our dependence on the military, our aggression towards one another, and it, it, we start the chain. So I'm gonna share the screen and I'm gonna ask you to pull out your cell phones and get to work. Let's see, this should do it. So really you're gonna be call, call, calling Congress, the phone number is right there. A switchboard operator will talk with you and ask you who you wanna speak with, say you wanna speak with your senators. Now the message, you gotta say your name and who you're a constituent of. And then this was the script that we've written down if you can't think of really what you want to say on the spot, um, but feel free to add what you need to add that speaks to your heart and what you want to see happen. Uh, with respect to Guantanamo, our international agreements on human rights and all other issues having to do with our militarized um, sort of overreach empire. All right, so get on your phone and get started. Okay, so it looks like pretty much everyone is done. Uh, California, it turns out we have a new senator, uh, Senator Padilla. Um, so you might have to call back twice to get to both of the senators, Feinstein and Padilla. Um, I'm going to now um, invite you to continue, follow up with an email to your senators. You can also follow up with an email to also your congressional representatives. Um, and we need to keep the push on. Uh, again, sign up or join the group that's created on the event page uh, to keep the pressure on. So I'm gonna pass it over to Doreen now as we finish out. Um, if you haven't finished your phone call, keep going for it, but I'm gonna pass it over to Doreen. Thanks. Okay, I just want to thank each and every one of you for attending this event and working to make sure that the Guantanamo prison is closed. Let's put an end to this shameless episode and close Guantanamo now. I want to thank the committee members who worked hard to make this event happen. Pat Alviso, Jan Meslin, Kathleen Hernandez, Julie Alley, Susan Kopecki, Ann Barron, Cheryl Canson, and our fabulous Zoom technician, JB. We also need to thank the organizations that sponsored and promoted this event. Veterans for Peace LA, Veterans for Peace National, Veterans for Peace San Diego, Peace Resource Center of San Diego, Orange County Peace Coalition, Answer LA, Poor People's Campaign, Code Pink, World Can't Wait, and Refuse Fascism. Goodbye, everyone, and please all stay safe, and thank you.